thank you for, for coming on. Obviously, you've had a, a very interesting journey. Um, I guess coaches from the UK, um, from someone who's coaching abroad as well, it's, it's really good to connect with someone who's kind of doing it even at a higher level. Um, just get some information from you on your journey, how that's been, um, next steps. I know you've got a new role coming up soon, and I know you can't really talk in too much detail about that yet, but <laughs> yeah, it's really great <laughs> Still progressing. Um, so, I guess first off, why don't you walk me through your, your journey, how you've got to where you are now, where you started, and, and how that process went for you? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we'll go back probably to when I was about 18. When I was 18, I went out to America on a football scholarship. So, I, I studied in the States for five years, and that was basically when I started coaching out there, um, I actually, my first ever coaching job was with a, a JV girls um, high school football team. Um, so obviously it was a, quite a, a low standard, but that was my first ever job and I, lo- and I loved it. Um, I worked a little bit with the, with the club teams in the summer in the States. And then once I, once I finished my degree, I mean, I'd always known that I wanted to, you know, to go into coaching and specifically management if possible. So I also did a, a degree in business management um, once I'd, which is where I'm from, and tried to get work. And I was working just for a, about a month in the, in the development centre at Newcastle and the, the head of the development centre asked if I, if I fancy going to Iceland. And the only reason he asked me was because I'd had experience living abroad before and that had three or four coaches over there that had not been able to last very long. So I don't think it was really anything based on my coaching ability or anything like that. It was more my um, ability to, to sustain sort of living out there. Um, so yeah, I went out there and that was, that was probably where it all started really. Um, I was coaching under 16s and under 19s at a Premier League club. And I did that for, for two years. Why? Manager of that team, Hamid Halgrimson, who was the manager who went on to lead Iceland in the Euros and, and World Cup. He was the, the head coach there at the time, so obviously fantastic working under him for a year. And then after him came Herman Ryderson and David James. So that was that was equally exciting, and I uh, I became Herman's assistant for a year. Had experience in the Europa League, which was brilliant. And then we all sort of separated our ways at the end of that season. And I went on my own and became a manager in my own right. I think I was 25 at the time at a first division club in Iceland where I stayed for four and a half years. Gained promotion, got relegated. Um, so a lot of experiences. And then my last job was working with another first division club. And now I've been working uh, KSI, which is the Icelandic Football Association, as a coach educator, and then as you said, I've just I've just accepted a job now in, in Denmark. I think I'm allowed to say that um, working working in the first division in Denmark as an assistant coach or part of the first team coaching staff, as well as uh, being the head of the under nineteen team there as well. So, in a nutshell, trying to keep it as short and sweet as possible, that's sort of uh, my radical journey that I've been on so far. You you were basically in Iceland through this whole, I guess, evolution of them becoming a relevant footballing force on the world stage. Yeah. What were your thoughts on why that was, how that came about? Was it a change in infrastructure? Was it just a cultural shift? What, what do you kind of put that down to in terms of the sudden emergence, I guess? Um, obviously, that, I don't think there's one single factor, but I've been asked that because of the attention that Iceland got. And a lot of people suggested that it could be, you know, the coaches, the way that the coach here, the facilities, um, because obviously the, with the weather and things, they've got a train indoor, so they've got some fantastic indoor facilities. Um, but in my opinion, the biggest by far, the biggest reason by far is the, the culture. Um, basically, if, you know, if you watch the Icelandic team in the Euros or the, or the World Cup, they were extremely hard work and, and, and very humble 
and that is really reflective of the of the culture here you know it's very very low unemployment so hard you know everyone's got a job um you get a job from the age of 14 so everyone works very very hard some people work two or three jobs which i find crazy i don't know how they do it um and i think that that was the biggest factor uh, i think that's I think you see that with many national teams, you know, when you look at, for example, Brazil, they've got a sort of way of a style of playing. Um, and I don't think that has much to do with the coaching staff or, or facilities. I think it's the culture of, of how the country is because it, it's always the same. Um, and I think that's, that's how it is with Iceland. And you've um, obviously mentioned your experience in the US as both a student and as a coach. Um, did you find that was one of the biggest challenges here in that, the culture is very, very different. It's obviously, there's a very, very competitive mindset and it's very athletically focused, but it's also spread across a number of sports and there's a real lack of clarity of focus and parental, I guess, not engagement because parents are obviously, in my view, overly engaged <laughs> at times. Um, but the educational part of it, in terms of what development, there, it seems to me that their primary concern is that their kids get to college rather than being you know, pro athletes in yeah. any specific sport. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating as someone who, who loves football or soccer as, as much as I do when you go to a country like that and it isn't number one, two, three, or even four, you know. And when you come from somewhere like England, or most countries in Europe, you know, if you walk into a bar or something like that, the thing that's on TV is football. And obviously in the United States, it's not like that. And that is a bit of a cultural shock and I think it's it's always going to be difficult for a nation to be the best at something when it isn't its, it's first choice sport um, because you know like I said before the culture sort of rubs rubs onto the player and affects the players you know all through the country um, but in terms of the competitive nature of the United States and and how you know sort of uh, forward and open people are that was something that really really developed me as a coach and and doing as an you know doing business management education side of things that really prepared me to to go into management because it's maybe an aspect you know doing things even something simple like a powerpoint presentation in front of a lot of people that's not something you normally get taught as a manager maybe on your way for b license or a license but in america that was big you know being able to talk publicly and things like that so there were aspects of my education in the united states that really prepared me very well um, so that you know it's like anything there's positives and there's negatives to come out of it but I'd definitely like to focus on the positives in the United States in that respect yeah 100% there's a it's certainly a more professional environment for players who aren't in a professional system um, I mean yeah. these kids here get three four times sessions a week uh, in England if you weren't in a professional academy you'd get maybe one session a week with a parent coach and a game of the weekend if you're lucky so yeah. and like you said there's a lot of analysis there's a lot of video there's even available to u12s and, and below if you want to use it in the us because they're so they do have that i guess professional approach to all all aspects of it um, definitely you mentioned in in iceland that one of the big factors that helped develop a, a culture that allowed them to be successful was humility um yeah. that's something that you found to be in terms of culture when you were moving across something that that, that approach that mindset helped you to adapt to being in another country obviously you'd already had an experience in the US but a different culture was it an easy adjustment for you yeah I think I think the best way I can describe you know their humility in this country is in England I'll use England because that's you know where I've been educated on my UA for B and my UA for A when you get when you go on to those licenses you're asked to show your knowledge it's a big big focus show your knowledge show your knowledge and in Iceland that is not the case as a coach you're not required to show your knowledge because sometimes when you're doing that, who are you doing it for? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing a good coach? Or are you doing it for the player's development, which is what you should be doing? And there's times when I watch coaches coach and they step in and interfere in a practice. And oh, it's almost to look good. In Iceland, it doesn't happen. You know, the coaches are quite quiet and they let the players play and it, it's they let the players solve their own problems. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very humble approach because they don't, the coaches don't feel like they have to show off. They don't feel like they have a point to prove. 
And if you can be comfortable in that environment as a coach, then I think that only benefits players, in, in my opinion. And that is something I've not come across in the States. It's not something I came across in England. That was something very unique to Iceland. And that took me a little bit of time to adjust to that. You, um, you put that down to, again, I think we're talking about some of the, the other countries where there's a sense of maybe entitlement and the coaching of the game is more ego-driven than player-centred uh, in terms of like coach-centred rather than player-centred. Uh, that's yeah. something that's trying to be shifted, in my view, now a lot with a lot more access to psychological elements of the game and you know, sports psychology and, and just a greater understanding of the mental health aspect and player relationships. Um, yeah, but like yeah. you said, it feels like that's that was a something that was very just organic and natural in Iceland due to, like I said, the culture of the people, as, as the culture of the people in Brazil is very um, geared towards playing soccer and football in the way that they play. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it is down to the culture. And you know, to give an example, I think, in, again, in, the cult, in cultures like in the United Kingdom, in America, athletes are built up and they're put on a pedestal. You know, they're, they're gods. And in Iceland, of course, they're very well respected and they're loved, but the media don't put them onto that pedestal. And if they're not on that pedestal to begin with, then they're not torn down like many a time they are in England or the UK. And because they're not therefore viewed as above anyone else, then it's a real unity within the country. You know, when, when Iceland qualified for the World Cup, the team went downtown Reykjavik and and drank with the fans. There wasn't a private party. There wasn't anything like that. It was everyone together. And um, I mean, I think that says it all, really. From your um, experience and insight through this period, what do you see the future for Iceland? Is it, were it was it a hotbed? Was it a hotbed of talent that grew? This, you know, you've all seen cycles of nations and, and clubs and countries coming through and being very good for a period, and then they kind of cycle back to the to the median. But what have you seen in terms of the Icelandic youth production continuation? How does that look moving forward? To that? Yeah, I think I think obviously when they qualify for the Euros and the World Cup, it was a, a you know golden generation. Definitely, I think all countries go through that cycle of producing you know that kind of talent. Um, but as far as I know, and I might be wrong on this, but I think that Iceland has the highest number of uh, youth products per capita in in Europe, mm. and you know, the way that the clubs are structured, the clubs that I've worked for, the, obviously the clubs want to win. They want to, they want to progress. They want to win championships. But I would say almost on an even keel to that is player development because the way that the, the clubs are sustainable is by selling players. And therefore, in order to do that, you need to put a lot of effort into player development in order to survive. And a lot of my jobs here, I would say, if you're producing players, if you're given time to produce players, they can almost forgive poor results, which is a really refreshing approach. And it is done so they can survive because they, they survive by selling footballers, basically. You mentioned your experience in the, in the Europa League. At that point, you were the youngest coach of a yeah. Europa League team. How was that experience for you in terms of you know, were you aware of it at the time? Um, was it something that you were conscious of as you were going into that position? Uh, I think the best way to describe it was mind-blowing because obviously when you're in the, the early stages of Europa League, there aren't a lot of big teams in the competition at that point. And we were, you know, for, the, for example, the first round, we played against the Faroese team and there was probably less than 200 people at the game. You know, it was, it was very, very low-key. But then we qualified for the next round by beating that team and it was against Red Star Belgrade. And I think there was, you know, there was definitely over 30,000 and it was like a cauldron, you know. And for, for that experience, it was just absolutely unbelievable. I think I was 23 at the time and Herman Aridison, who was player coach, decided he was going to play, which was, it was the best thing to do because in order to handle that sort of experience, you needed to have played in those sort of uh, happens that atmosphere before so it was the right thing to do but I don't think I knew about it until maybe a day or two before that I was going to be the head coach on the you know on the team sheet so yeah I think when you do something like that when you sort of hit that high it's it's like a drug you know you're just addicted you just want you're just chasing that that game again or that experience again and while I've not 
being able to get to that point yet. It's always sort of in the back of your mind. You know, I want it, I want to be there again. I want to do that again because it's just something that you can't really describe. You know, someone who I've never played before. Um, and, uh, you know, you get a lot of people telling you you can only go so far in the game if you haven't played or if you, you haven't got certain contacts. But, you know, once you've experienced that, so that's something that never gets taken away from you. And it's, it's worth all the hard hours that you put in. And, um, and touching on, on that process of yours, you mentioned um, obviously you had promotion, um, relegation, had nominations to manager of the year, manager of the year in the first division. Um, what did you learn from, what did you learn most from? Did you learn most from the promotion? Did you learn more from relegation? What was the part that really you took with you to help your development? Um, I think, I think there's so, you know, there's so many different things that you, that you learn from that. Um, I think, you know, to focus maybe on one was, I remember after achieve, achieving promotion, I think it was, I went on to a, like a radio show and I was introduced as the next Pep Guardiola of Iceland. I was, 20, I was 26, okay? And, you know, hand on heart at the time, you say you don't want to allow things to get into your head. You don't want to become big-headed and especially not in a country like this where it is so humble. Um, but, I think, you know, when I've looked back and I've reflected, there might have been times when subconsciously that might have gone to my head a little bit, you know, and that maybe I thought I was clever or better than I actually was. And the relegation really sort of brought me back down to earth, if you want. And that, you know, I look at it as a positive thing because I needed, I needed that because I learned, you learn a lot more by losing than you do by winning, 100%. Um, so I think, you know, there's a reason... People, people said to me, you know, you're, you're too young to be a manager at the age of 25, 26. And I disagree with that because people say, you know, you need to have experience. But I don't really believe it's the experience of coaching per se. I think it's the experience of dealing with everything that goes around it. You know, the politics and handling media. I think that's when you need experience. So I think my style, my coaching hasn't changed too much from when I coached at 25, my first job or at all. But I think my... I sort of uh, the way that I handle everything else that I would like to think I hope that I've uh, learned from that and I've grown from that. When you um, when you went into these roles in the first time as as head coach as manager, how important was you to be able to curate your own staff and have people around you that you both trusted and knew could fill in gaps in your either knowledge or in the areas where you knew you maybe weren't so strong? And how did you how did you go about that process? Um. I think the first thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to have an Icelandic assistant. So I've always had an Icelandic assistant at all the clubs that I've been at. Um, and the reasoning behind that is because, you know, firstly, language. Um, everyone speaks good English here. And being English, I've been too lazy, as in not learning the language. Or maybe not clever enough, one of the two, I'm not sure. Um, but I needed an Icelandic person who truly understands the culture of that club. Um, who understands what the players are saying when they're talking amongst themselves in the dressing room. Um, if there's a, you know, if you need to get a message across quickly on the pitch and maybe English isn't the right time to do it, they're there to do that. So it was crucial to get an assistant who was Icelandic. And what I also tried to do was get somebody who knew the club very well. So, you know, my first assistant had played there for, at the club for 10 years. My second one was like a legend, had the most ever games he'd ever played at, at the club. So that was really important. And then along with that, I, I put a lot of emphasis on my physio. So I wanted a really, really good physio because in Iceland, the, the season is short. You play a lot of games. It's almost like England is now playing, you know, every three days. And you have to have a good physio. So, I, you know, we spent a little bit extra money on that and the conditioning side of things. And then I've always brought in an English goalkeeper coach. Um, I believe from my experience that English... English coaches are very analytical and they're good with the that's you know aspect. So I've always had them to do the sort of the clipping and uh, opposition analysis, set piece analysis, and things like that. So that's generally how I've sort of built up my built up my stuff. You mentioned obviously using the analytics. I I assume that the departments that you had, like I said, you used the goalkeeper coach for the British staff to do that. But how important was that in terms of? development of, of the players, development of the coaching staff in using analysis and data is obviously becoming much, much more relevant and 
it seems in the game as we move forward into the current era. Yeah, it's massive. It's massive. I think um, I think that's probably one of our main strengths is doing that because it, it's so important. You know, one of the when when you're in a country like Iceland that hasn't got a load of money, it hasn't got its own you know analyst guy, then it's really important that you know as the the manager or goalkeeper coach, whoever you try to you try to do that ourselves and that's what we had to do and we did things like sort of uh you know we didn't have like a, a database so to speak so we created a database and created things like video diaries whereby you know you would film a player and and their attributes that they were good at and that they were needed to work on and we would look to you know add to that diary every couple of months and show them visually so they could see their improvements and that was that's something that wasn't in place in Iceland at any club and that's something that we try to develop and it's it's absolutely crucial. It's really crucial. You were um, obviously the first team coach but you'd had experience in working in the academy system. How important was it to you that there was um, a consistent philosophy, consistent style through the academy as you obviously wanted to prepare players to come through that academy system into your first team? Yeah, I mean firstly that was a big that is a big challenge and I because in Iceland they have two separate boards so you have a board that controls the academy and a board that controls the first team they come under the same club but that politically is a challenge but it was so important to try and unite that um, and I think one of the most important things is, is when you go into a job as a, as a head coach or as a manager is not to think short term you have to think right if I'm here for five years or six years that's your mindset I think when I first went into, you know, into Throttle with my first job, I was a bit short-sighted. And then after three or four years, I was sort of looking around and I was like, we haven't got the players here coming through that we need. And if I'd started this you know, from the first day, then I would be in a lot better position now. So I think it's crucial as a head coach when you go into a club is to imagine you're going to be there for at least five years and you need to put something in place that is a red line that is running through the club from the first team down to the youngest age group. You all the coaches on site about the, the things that you're going to coach, the philosophy you're going to teach, the style of player that you want to develop. And you, you do that from the first day because you leave it and then it's too late. Do you, speaking of that, do you have a set structured game model that you like to work towards or is it dependent on the the team you come into and you kind of adjust it on the basis of the players you have or do you work as you mentioned just now to build that over the longer term into the game model that you want the team to play um the principles the philosophy and and what does that look like for you yeah i think i think every coach has probably got their sort of um ideal style and way that the They've got their clear philosophy in their mind. But obviously, it depends, it depends on the type of players, like you said. We, what we try to do is, you, you make judgments over combination of both, I suppose, is my answer. Um, you do something in between the two. Do you have any any fixed you know, principles that you work towards? Um, I, I, not principles in as much as identity as you, you look at Liverpool now and you see a lot of what they say, and they say, our identity is intensity. Is there one, I guess, key tenant that you would want all of the teams that you coach to be very focused on. So you could say, well, that's a, that's a Greg Ryder team. That's a, that's a Proto team. Yeah, all the way yeah. through the age groups. Yeah, I think...
um, had similar traits and sometimes they have not been completely Hi, I'm back. I lost you for a second there, Greg. I'll just have to start video. Okay, sorry about that. You're good. Um, okay, so I lost all of that. It, it kind of cut off while you were still saying all of that. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, just uh, what we forget that I guess, that you would want to see in in your teams as as, as you've started that process. Anything useful then? And I guess my question for you in terms of recruitment, how how did that work for you? Obviously you mentioned before that this as a smaller country with smaller clubs, the aim for a lot of clubs is to help players to make money for the club. Um but how does that affect your ability to recruit? Is it very internalized in terms of recruiting Icelandic players? Um, or are you able to kind of go above and beyond that to find players that are potentially players who could be saleable into the bigger leagues and European markets? Yeah, I think, firstly, one of the biggest mistakes um, when we got relegated was that I recruited a, a lot of foreigners. I think we had maybe nine or ten foreigners probably five or six different nationalities between them. And by doing that, we lost a lot of our identity, you know, and, and, and culture within the team. And that was a big mistake. And that was, you know, I made that mistake because I'd never done it before. That was why it happened. You know, I, I hadn't had experience of that. Um, and basically from that point onwards, I've sort of drawn the line at three, maybe four foreigners as a limit within a squad. And then the rest are to be whole based um, by that I mean by being from Iceland but of course and I think with any team in the world the, you know the better teams have always got homegrown players if possible so I'll say first and foremost in terms of recruitment you look to recruit from within that's number one um, number two would be the best young players coming through in Iceland that you can get access to and then after that Icelandic players, regardless of age, who can come in and, and do a job. And then, so the fourth, the fourth one is probably then you look to a foreigner. Um, it's very, very rare that you'd bring a foreigner into Iceland to sell them on. So normally the age is, is not really relevant when you're looking to sign foreign players. You, um, and how did you deal with any players who it adjusted the culture in the dressing room because of the foreigners, the languages and, and that difference in culture? How did you... You navigate players who are counter to your culture, who are, like I said, affecting the culture negatively. Is it such a, a position as you work very hard to use the players you have who are very cultural leaders, as it were, to help develop those players? Or is it you just have to work to remove those players from the group as, as early as possible if they're not able to be adjusted? Yeah, I think, I think firstly, again, to, to reflect upon mistakes, I think that you know, in that year when we got relegated, we should have put more emphasis at the very beginning of getting the foreign players to know the culture. Um, and I'm not just talking about in, in the dressing room, I'm talking about the national culture, you know, get them to know Iceland and what Iceland's all about. I think we should have put more emphasis on that. Um, and obviously that was a mistake. And you can do that from whether it's players in the, in the team, coach and staff, you know, just staff in the club. I wish that we'd done that a little bit more and that's definitely something I would look to, to do in the future. Um, but then we also had examples that players just simply did not fit. And that again is, in my opinion, you know, our mistake that we've not done enough research on a, on a player's character and ability to, to adapt. So I would never blame the player for that. That's again, you know, that's my error for not doing enough research on a player. So, I suppose, you know, there's there's a lot of mistakes in there. You know, there is a lot of mistakes and you make a lot of mistakes and it's been, Iceland's been a fantastic country to be able to make those mistakes. Um, and you just have to hold your hands up and say, right, I've made those, but I've learned from them. I don't let them happen again. Because obviously 
you, you have learned a hell of a lot. Looking, looking back at that now, and as you mentioned, would you say you've kind of moved more towards really being conscious of a player or, or staff member's character before you commit to bringing them on as part of your, your team? Um, uh, we had a conversation with Steve McLaren not too long ago and he mentioned that one of the things that Sir Alex Ferguson did at Manchester United was he would always, always meet the player individually, go out for dinner with them and he would observe their behaviours to judge their character before, in a way to know that if he thought they were the right fit for his dressing room. Is that something you would put more emphasis on now looking back at that? Yeah, definitely. I would say I would put character ahead of ability. Um, I think... I think that the character can take yourself, especially when you're at a club. For example, we just got promoted, and therefore it was always going to be a relegation battle. And I think there was going to, there were so many games on reflection that just needed a little bit more character. You know, the skill level wouldn't have taken us over the line, but the character would have done. So I know that you said there, Steve McLaren met them. I don't know if that's even enough. I don't know if you can gauge someone's character. I think you can get a good idea from someone's character from meeting them, but I think you have to spend a little bit of time with them and speak to a lot of neutral people about them. You know, really do your research on them because, you know, people it, people are all different and how one person is going to suit a certain style or a certain club or a country, it all differs. So I would, I would definitely put more research and emphasis on, on that side of things. And as you look to your next move, the, the move to Denmark, Obviously, moving in a way to a, another country that's very focused on development of youth players, um, very focused on having players who are then able to move into the bigger leagues. So, part of your role as you move there is going to be developing players as your under 19 role for the first team, but also yeah. then working with those players in, in the ability to build them up. And, and Denmark's obviously one of those kind of cycles now where they've got a lot of really top young players coming through. Um, what, what are your, I guess, what are your ambitions for that role? What are your ambitions for the future are following on from this move? Yeah, I think, like you said, you know, the, the development of players is something that really interests me. I think in my last job, it, it thought, oh, I was only there It must be this Icelandic connection. Um, one last question for you guys. Um, uh, can you give one piece of advice to coaches who, you know, want to coach at the highest level, who are, you know, maybe coaching grassroots now, maybe coaching academy, but they want to continue to progress, want to continue to develop. What would that one piece of advice to, to those guys be? Um, I think, obviously, ambition is, is important. You've got to have ambition, but I think most people do. You know, if you're in grassroots, you have got ambition to be better and to make other people better around you. But I think at the same time, you've got to, you've got to be content and you've got to be happy in what you're doing. You know, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to work in football, whether it's a part-time or full-time job. It is an absolute privilege. You know, I've been unemployed for nine months now and... Just every day I've missed being involved in football. So I don't think anyone should ever take that for granted, that we're, we're very lucky to be 
you know, being able to have conversations like this instead of being stuck behind a desk and doing something that you hate. So I think appreciate where you are because that's massive, but always, always have that ambition to, to want uh, to make yourself better if you can and, and just believe in yourself that you can do it because no one else does. No one will believe you can achieve something, especially if you don't. So just have, just have your own self-belief. Perfect. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Um, thank you for you know, walking us through your journey and best of luck with the new role.